Bibles and turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 1. Oh, would you place that? And then we're going to look at a couple other verses right quick. Uh, turn to Hebrews 13. I want to give you this before we get too far. Hebrews 13. Uh, again, I want, uh, want you to hold your Bibles and keep them handy. In this study, we're going to get deep. We're going to go deep fast, and we're going to stay deep for a little bit. Uh, we give some shallow stuff and some practical stuff here and there, but tonight I need you to put your thinker on, follow along with me in the Scriptures, because if you get lost, you're going to be lost. Amen? Not, not lost as in salvation, but it'd be hard to keep up and understand what's going on. So I do want to encourage you, take your Bibles and follow along. If I'm getting too fast, because I've got a lot of ground to cover, if I get too fast, just sit there and smile at me. Just jot the verse down and go home and look it up. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is good, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Now listen, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the honor of kings to search it out. We should have our hearts established with grace. We should be more concerned about the souls of men and how and the affairs of men and what's affecting them. What I'm teaching tonight is deep doctrine. It's great that we know it, but it does not matter when it comes right down to it. So don't let this don't let this knowledge make you think you know more than somebody else, or this knowledge makes you more spiritual than anybody else. It don't. It don't. I thank the Lord, and I'm excited when I get the book and I see this stuff. And I was excited ready to run around the house today. It's great. But don't let don't 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 think that you have to get so deep that you get so heavenly minded you're no earthly good, so to speak. That's right. Uh, so, so even though we're going deep, that don't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about the souls of men and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what we're going to be dealing with. Look at verse 1 in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, I've already told you just through the study that the deep is water above your head. And in this study, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to show you the verses and then give you some things to think about and show you some things that, that you can see if you'll study your Bible. This book is amazing. I, I, it's amazing. There's more science and more fact in this book than you can get anywhere. Amen. Anywhere. All the books of the world combined together, no matter the subject, the topic, or, or, or the uh, 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 degree of education the authors have, can top this book. You can put them all together and they won't even hold a candle to this book. But anyway, we're going to look at the deep. And uh, it's fitting. We're going deep in the deep. Amen. Uh, we're, going to look at the, we're going to look at several things. We're going to look at the label. Why it's called the deep. Uh, what is it, and so forth and so on. We're going to look at what it's labeled, what it's called how, in the Bible. Then we're going to look at the location, where to find it in the Scripture, and where is it geographically. Where is it geographically? Then we're going to look at Leviathan just for a moment. Arr, mate, there's something in them narrow waters. Amen. <laughs> there's something in them waters. It gives you something to think about. Then we'll, there are just a couple of lessons that we'll learn from it and then the leaving of it. And you say, what do you mean? We're going through that one of these days. We're going to go past that place. We're going right through there. We're going to see these waters. But anyway, first of all, let's go ahead and look at the label. In, in, in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, it's called the deep. And when you get to looking at it, it also defines the deep. Not only can we see that it's called the deep, but in verse 2 at the end of the verse, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we know we're talking about waters. I showed you this last week, but look at verse 6. And God said, let, the, let a firmament in the midst of the, and let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Yep. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. 
and God called the firmament heaven. Now look up here at the chart for a second. You might have to move the camera here if you want to. But uh, here's, here's what it is. You've got waters right here. He divided the waters from the waters. That's what he's done. And he said, in the midst, let there be a firmament. And the firmament he called heaven. That's where the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, all the constellations, that's where all that is located. That's all in that section right there. That's what them little dots and stars and galaxies and all that stuff. You got water above this solar system and water below this solar system right there in the passage we just read. Now, a lot of your commentators will try to make this the oceans. We know it's not the oceans and the sea on the earth because they show up next. Look at this, verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathered... And now watch. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. He, he, he got of the waters. So... There's water on the earth. He got of the waters, but he didn't get all the waters. There's still water above and below, according to the Genesis 1 there. Now, it'll make more sense in a little bit. Uh, now, I'm going to show you something else. Turn to Genesis 7. We're going to skip over. Uh, I don't have a Schofield Bible with me. Uh, Genesis 7. Somebody look in the margin of Genesis 7 and 8, the middle margin at the top there, and give me the date. I'm skipping over about 1,500 to 2,000 years in just a couple. Huh? 4,000 In Genesis 8. Yeah, you, you're at the beginning. <laughs> I knew what it was at the beginning. 2349. Huh? 2349. 2349. So we skipped over nearly 2,000 years with just a couple of turns of our pages. I, I, so we're talking about the flood of Noah now. We're not talking about the flood of Genesis 1-1. We're talking about the flood of Noah. In Genesis 7, look at this. Now we're talking about the label. What is this called? In verse 11, look toward the end of the verse. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Where did the waters come from in the days of Noah? He opened up the windows of heaven and let the water come down on the earth. That's where the water came that flooded the earth. This water is going to be massive compared to the earth because it covers the whole span of our universe. It's above us. We'll see some stuff in a little bit. Look in chapter 8, verse 2. We're still proving that it's water. there's water above your head according to the Scriptures. In verse, chapter 8, verse 1, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters of sage. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually. Now, in Noah's flood, again, it's not to be confused with the flood of Lucifer, Genesis 1.1, we talked about that last week. Uh, and here's how you can know the difference. In, in the flood... Oh, I wish I had drew something else up there. Uh, let's see here. I'll just, I don't know if you can see this or not. I'm just going to race this off here for a minute. I can draw it back in a minute. But in the flood, uh, Genesis 1... The earth was said to be in the water and out of the water. It was created, heaven and the earth was created in God's presence. That's going to be the throne of God. It went through and was in darkness, void without form, and it stayed there until he took up and finished, uh, it, until he took up and completed. Uh, well, I keep saying completed. That's not the word. Once he pushed it through, it was void and without form in Genesis 1-2. Uh, 
Then from Genesis 1-3 through the remainder, those six days of recreation and the seventh day of rest is what takes place. Almost 2,000 years pass, then he's going to flood it again during Noah's day. That water comes down on the earth, not the earth standing in the water and out of the water. Like it was bobbing. Like a, you ever throw a bobber in the water? And if it leave it there long enough, what does it do? It'll sink. It's waterlogged. And it starts breaking apart, void, without form. So there's a good picture there if you get a hold of it. I don't know if I was blocking y'all or not. All right, but anyway, let's, let's go ahead. Uh, we covered that last week in the gap. Uh, but what I wanted to point out this week to make sure you realize the Holy Spirit's more careful with words. That's why you don't mess with the Bible. Do not mess with the Bible or you'll lose it. I'm going to show you something. In 2 Peter, turn to 2 Peter real quickly. 2 Peter chapter 3. Hold your place there in Genesis. Uh, in, yeah, I'm right past it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Peter 3, 5. This for this they willingly are ignorant of by the word of God. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Okay? In Genesis 1.1 the earth perished. That's what that was a reference to. And the earth was in the water. He created it in the third heaven and then he pushed it through, basically. Pushed it into the water. Then when he started, when he started, let there be light, then he divided the water, then he started making the dry land and everything appear out of what was left of that. Alright, now watch how it's worded in, in chapter 8 of Genesis. Noah's flood, watch how it's worded. The earth is not in the water and out of the water. The water's on the earth. Look at this. Uh, verse 3. And the waters return from off the earth. Look at verse 7. End of the verse. And the waters dried up from off the earth. Verse 8. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Verse 9. Toward the middle. The waters were on the face of the whole earth. Verse 11. Into the verse. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. You see that difference? The Holy Spirit's very careful in how he words it. Look at verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year of the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. That's interesting to me. The, the, the Holy Spirit's very careful with these words, and it, uh, I'll show you something on that in a little bit. Here's a, just a couple more verses to show you that there is water above your head. Psalms 148. Psalms 148. Praise Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise ye Him, all His angels. Praise ye Him, all His hosts. Praise ye Him, sun and moon. Praise ye Him, all ye stars of light. Where are we? We're in outer space, right? Praise ye Him, heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Yeah. On earth, right here is two heavens. You say, what do you mean two heavens? Well, when you step outside and look up, you see the clouds and you see where the birds fly, that's the first heaven. At night, when the sky is clear and you can see past our atmosphere and you can see where the stars and the galaxies and the sun and the moon in the outer space, so to speak, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is where God is, amen? And that's above it. So that's what this, this dot kind of represented would be like where God is. Amen. And it talks about He's light, so we'll make it kind of like the sun. He's a consuming fire. 
Uh, all right, but anyway, so there's a little bit there. Psalms 40, 148, verse 4. Psalms 148, 4. You see that there's water above your heads. And if you want a reference to the third heaven, because a lot of people may not have heard that. I'm not sure, but there's three heavens. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 2, Paul, I can, Paul, Paul talks about when he was called up into the third heaven. Yeah. So if he calls one the third heaven, then there must be two more. Okay, so and that's what they were. It's, this is simple so far. It's going to start slow, but it's going to get deep quick. Now, the deep is also called by other names in the scripture. It's called the great deep in Genesis 7 and verse 11. We've already read it. Turn to Isaiah 51. Turn to Isaiah 51. And you'll see that it's also called the great deep. Look at this. Isaiah 51, verse 10. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea and the waters of the great deep and hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Now, I don't have time to go in and, 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 and dissect every verse that I'll read to you. But notice the great deep is mentioned in the passage. Then look at verse 9 last, the la at the last. You have a dragon being mentioned with this great deep. That's right. There's a dragon associated with the deep right there. Yeah. I'm going to show you that quite a few times before this is over. Uh, in verse 11, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Woo! That's not Jerusalem. That's a heavenly Zion. We'll, that's a, I'll give you something on that in a little bit too. Alright, now let's keep going. Uh, turn to Revelations. Revelations chapter 4. Revelations chapter 4. We're talking about the, the label. What all it's called in the Word of God. You'll find it called the deep. The great deep. And in Revelations 4, it's called the Sea of Glass, and sometimes it's also referred to as the Crystal Sea. Now look at it, chapter 4, verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass likened to crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, where it goes into describing the beasts that are about the throne. Revelations chapter 15, just a couple pages over. Revelations chapter 15. Verse 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass. Amen. So it's called the sea of glass, the crystal sea, the great deep, and they're standing on it. You say, how do you stand on water? All right, Job. Job, chapter 38. Job, chapter 38. Look at verse 30. At the end of the verse, it says, The face of the deep is frozen. The face of the deep is frozen. You know, in outer space, they say it's absolute zero. It's so cold, everything stops moving. Uh, down here on Earth, we can have ice, and we call zero on the air thermometer, zero degrees Fahrenheit. We, 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 that's freezing, but things still move. When all activity ceases, we got like negative 426 or 400. 36, I can't remember which one. 400, it's a negative 400 and some degrees where absolutely nothing moves, ceases. That's what they say is in heaven. Well, if that's the case, I understand why it's frozen. Amen? It's something to think about. But here's something to think about. Uh, how many of you, how many, did anybody watch the launch of SpaceX uh, launch that rocket or that capsule uh, about a week back? Did anybody watch that? 
see them send it up. Now, they're supposed to send it up, send it up one day, and for bad weather, there was a storm coming in, they canceled it, and they had to put it off, and then they did it on a Saturday, and it went up without a hitch. All right? Now, I'm going to give you something to think about. What's associated with that water? Didn't I say a dragon? What did they name that space ship? Not spacecraft. We call them spaceships. It's going into outer space. Why don't we call it a spacecraft or a space rocket? Or No, they call it a spacecraft. What was the spacecraft called that they sent up? The dragon. 1969, when, they, when man sent up and landed on the moon, what was the name of that one? Apollo. Yeah. Apollyon. The destroyer. Oh, I'm telling you, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, he's got control of that. We're going to see that before it's over with. Uh, here's something. There's water over your head. When Jesus left glory and came down, he came through the water and came down here. You know the first four people he picked were fishermen? Yeah, that's right, brother. He, he said, yeah. what, what, are we called to do? what did he say to them? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's right. Fishermen. How do we liken soul winning? To fishing. To fishing. Oh, yeah. What's the Christian symbol? Somebody tell me what. Why do you think it's a fish? Because we're underwater. I mean, this is a simple. That's a pitiful fish. <laughs> I can't draw, but you know, that is, that's a pitiful fish. But anyway, uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. It's interesting. Uh, men do things and they don't even realize what they're doing sometimes. They don't even realize what they're doing. Uh, you can see... God's hand all over something, and sometimes you can see Satan's hand all over something. Amen? But let's keep going. I'm going to show you some more stuff here. Let's see. Number two in the outline, if you're keeping up with notes, the location. Where is this body of water at? Geographically speaking, where is it? Well, we know it's above the earth, but the earth's round, so it depends on where you stand and which way you point. You know what I mean? If I'm pointing here and somebody's on the other side of the world pointing, we're both pointing in the wrong direction. You see what I'm saying? We know the earth because he, he talks about the circle of the earth, so which way are we talking, really, literally? And you know, God's amazing. He made it where you know where he is. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Anywhere on the face of the earth, you can tell where his throne is. It's called a compass. It points true north. True north. Now watch, now watch. Uh, I'll show you what I'm talking about. In Revelations 4, verse 6, I have to show you like this. In Revelations 4, look at verse 6. And before the throne was the sea of glass. So we know wherever the throne is, the sea of glass is right in front of it. That's that sea right there. All right. Now let's keep a look at uh, Revelations 22. Revelations 22, verse one. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Now we got it. Proceeding out of the throne of God. The water running out of the water of life, the crystal sea, uh, is flowing from the throne of God into the deep. The great deep. Amen? That's what it's picturing there. That's what it's picturing. Now, just, just take it for what it says. Now, what, where is that though? That, that tells me it's at the throne, but that don't tell me where the throne is. Alright, Psalms 75. Psalms 75. Second. Psalm 75, Luke verse 6. For promotion cometh neither, now listen to it, for, for promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. What direction was missing? North. What was substituted for the word north or the direction north? God. 
God is north. His throne is north. Promotion comes from Him. He's on His throne. It comes from the north. All right, let's keep keep looking. Job. Go back a little further. Go back to Job 26. Told you we was going to look tonight. We was going to use it. And that's what we need to do. To, it's amazing when you get in the book, you get to reading passages, you just go through real fast, just looking at what it actually says. It's amazing. Job 26. Uh, we'll start verse 7. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and he hangeth the earth upon nothing. He stretches out the north over the empty place, there's waters here, waters there, north over the empty place. All right, so think about what he's saying. Yeah, I've lost my place. Did the Bible turn on me? No. He stretches out the north over the empty place. He hangeth the earth upon nothing. He, he bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He hold, holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He, he hides His throne from us. It's hidden from us. What do you mean it's hidden? We can't see it. We can't see it. We can look, 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 and we can't see it. You can look with the most powerful telescope and you'll never see the throne of God. Nope. They can't find it. They say space is infinite. No, God's infinite. Amen. Space is not infinite. That's right. He told us He named all the stars. He numbered them and named them. They're, they're, they're not infinite. He's infinite. Now, here's an interesting thought. The Bible talks about a, a, a molten looking glass and likens it to a mirror. I ain't got time to show you all the verses, but this is just something about it. This is not doctrine. This is just an interesting observation. When they say space is infinite, what if they're looking through their powerful telescope past millions of stars and they see that frozen face of the deep and it's like a mirror reflecting back. And it goes past and it comes down here and they see the frozen face of the deep and it's a mirror and it goes back. How many of you have ever been somewhere where, where they have what they call the infinity mirror? They put a mirror on each side. You look in this one and it reflects back and it reflects back and it looks like you go on forever. That's interesting. What if God's got this thing set up with mirrors? Maybe there ain't but 10 billion stars He named, but when they look, it looks like trillions and trillions of stars. That's interesting, ain't it? You say, well, they figure it out. Them stars is wondering. They can't figure it out. Millions? And by the time they figure it out, they, they ain't going to catch up with God. They ain't going to catch up with Him. Here's something else. Isaiah 14. I ain't going to make you turn there. It's about, it's about when Satan fell. What did he say? When Satan fell, I will be like the Most High. I will ascend and put my throne on what? The sides of the north. So, so, north. North. Amen. On the sides of the north. There's sides there. Why? Because it comes up to a point. You'll see that in a second. I'll, I'll get to show you something on that in a minute. All right. So, that's roughly... What I wanted to show you. Now we're going to talk about something in Job 41. Job 41. You say, wait a minute. That's about Leviathan, that crocodile. That hippopotamus. <laughs> yeah, that's what the commentators want you to believe. That's what the devil would love for you to believe. But it's not. In Job chapter 41, you have a perfect picture of the devil. Leviathan is the devil. It describes him to a T. And you know what it says? He maketh the deep, verse 31, 40, chapter 41, 31. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He talks about making a path that you think it was horrid. Now, now watch. 
He's traveling through. He's traveling through there. You say, what do you mean he's traveling through there? Job chapter 1. He, he told, he came, from, there was a time when the sons of God came to present themselves before God and Satan came up with them. And God asked him, where you been? And he said, coming to and fro, walking up and down in the earth. He's at the, he's at the front of the throne of God in heaven. And he talks about coming back and forth, so he travels back and forth. That's why I said there'd be monsters in them there waters. That's why when you get an old map, they always show a sea monster in the ocean because the commentators thought the Bible talking about the deep was water here on earth, and it's not. It's water above us. Amen. Amen. That's why they'd always show those sea monsters on the map. That's why they were afraid to go across the sea for so long. They was afraid of sea monster because they read their Bible that there was a monster in there. And there is. Amen. Uh, get my study on Leviathan, you'll find out there's a, like a seven-headed dragon thing in there. I'm just going to draw him. That's like an old squiggly line with seven heads, but there's something in there traveling back and forth. He is called the prince of the power of the air. The god of this world. All right. I'll give the verses on that later if you want them. But anyway, Leviathan. Now again, all the commentators try to make the deep our oceans and our seas, but the biblical references to Leviathan is a picture of Satan, and they missed it. Uh, get my study on Leviathan. It's on CD. I think it may even be on the internet. So if somebody wants to watch it, uh, or I, don't, I think it's audio on the internet. Now. Yeah, they can look it up. But anyway, notice something. Remember a while ago in Isaiah 51, I, I pointed out that the dragon was associated with the deep? Let me show you something. Turn to, uh, oh, where was that? Revelations 20. Revelations 20. I'm going to have to pick the page up. I've got a lot of verses to show you yet. Revelations 20 and verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Guess what Satan's called? He's called the serpent, he's called the devil, and he's also called the dragon. Yeah. That's interesting, ain't it? Chapter 12. Go back to chapter 12. Revelations chapter 12. Now watch this. We'll start reading about verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Where was the war? In heaven. That's not in the sky where the birds are flying. That's, that's in outer space in the third heaven. That's the heaven there. And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, and was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So there you have him being cast out. And here's something interesting. Now this happens during the tribulation, but look at verse 16. And the earth helped the woman, that's Israel, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth? During the tribulation, when he's cast out of heaven, he comes through the water, he takes a big gulp, and when he lands, he's going after Israel, and a flood comes from his mouth. Where did that water come from? He's trying to mock God. Amen? And when God floods, it's a local flood. It's not going to flood the whole earth, but there's a flood. That's interesting, ain't it? Yes, sir. That's interesting. Now, I want to show you something. Never thought of before. Romans 8. Here's something that we all like to read. We're all very familiar with this passage, but did you really catch what's in this passage? Romans chapter 8. I'll find it in a second. Give me a second. Romans 8, verse 38. 8, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Now watch, verse 39 carefully. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. 
There's a creature associated with height and depth. Did you catch that? In the heights, the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, he is, yeah, he's out there. He's out there. You just think, preacher, I think you're out there. I might be. I might be. But I believe this book, amen, and I believe it's got it. I believe when it's all said and done, you're going to find out how true it is. And I'm going to show you some pictures before the study's over, hopefully, that will make it make sense like that. Now, uh, let's, let's go on to number three and let me give you the, a, a lesson here. Uh, there's some, many things we can learn. First of all, we learn Satan's not bound like a lot of preachers preach today. He's loose. He's the God of this world. He's not in hell ruling and reigning right now. Hell was created for the devil that he'll suffer. Right, right. Not for him to rule and reign. He had rule and reign of the first earth. And when it when he fell, it went through the water and it was destroyed and God created a new one and put a new king, Adam. And when he saw it, he was jealous he came down here and tempted Eve, probably just like he did Job. He probably told God, said, yeah, I can get him to fall. It won't be hard at all. He goes to the woman and gets her to eat, and Adam eats willingly. Right. Willingly gives his life for his wife. Perfect picture of the Lord giving his life for us. Amen. Amen. Oh, it's interesting. But he got the kingdom back. He's the God of this world. How else could he offer Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he had bowed down to him. There he is. Amen? For now. For now. The rightful king is coming one day. But anyway, there's all kinds of lessons we can learn. But let me show you something here in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Yeah, i got to hurry. I know it's, I've got 10, 15 minutes yet, but I, I need to hurry because i got a lot of notes yet. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. Here's a verse that everybody messes up. Everybody preaches on it wrong. Everybody messes it way up. We'll start in verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that ye being rooted and grounded in love, come, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ. All your commentators say, that's the love of Christ. You can't comprehend the depth, the breadth, the width, and the height. But that's not what that verse says. It talked about the depth, the breadth, the width. And it's something different. And the love of Christ. So what is it talking about there? It's talking about the height and the depth. He wants you to understand some of this stuff. He wants us to understand this stuff. It's in His Word for us to understand some of this stuff. That goes with that Romans 8 there a little bit. Now, go to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. It's going to get interesting here. This is where you. This is this is this is what's going to excite you when you when you get a hold of this. Psalms 104, we'll read, uh, we'll just start right at the beginning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Notice the wording, thou art clothed, he's clothed, he's, we're talking about his clothing, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment. So God, God is light. Pure energy. God's light. Covers himself with light. As a garment. Okay? Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Like a curtain. A curtain hangs. Now we know the earth is hung on nothing, but a curtain hangs. How many of you ever hung curtains? They just droop down. You ever been to Alaska? I've never been, but I, I, I went today and I, I looked at some uh, videos where somebody had shot some videos of the northern lights and it looks like fabric. It's amazing. It's like the heavens is a curtain that he's hanging up for us to see. And it's going to make sense in a minute. Uh, so God is clothed with a garment. Isaiah 51 
Hold your place there, and I go to Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. This is the same chapter where in verse 9 it mentioned the dragon. In verse 10 it talked about the great deep. In verse 11 it talked about the redeemed going through. But look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. Lift up your eyes to heavens, to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. So he's just likened the earth and heavens to a garment. To a garment. Now it's interesting. Now we know he's clothed and he just likened it to a garment. Proverbs 30. Uh, turn to Proverbs 30. In Proverbs 30. I think I just put Proverbs 30 in my notes. I didn't say which verse it is. You might have to give me a second to find it. Four. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? So, he's clothed and he likened the waters to a garment. He's likened the heavens to a garment. He's liking the earth to be in a garment. It's starting to make sense, ain't it? He's wearing it. Now there's something that's going to start making sense. God clothed Himself with the universe. He wears it like a garment. And one day He's going to remove that garment and fold them up. Turn to Hebrews. I'm going to show you some more verses. You just... Stay patient and it'll come together. Hebrews, be sure to look at this. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Oh, listen, it has worded. Verse 10. And thou, o Lord, in the beginning, there's Genesis 1 1, has laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of thy hands. There's Genesis chapter 1 3 through the rest. You have one one when he created it. Then you have when he made the heavens and restored the earth afterwards. Look at this. Verse 11, They shall perish, but thou remainest. Amen. Amen. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but he's not. And they shall wax old as doth a what? Garment. So he's likened the heavens to a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. He's going he's to take that vesture off one day, and it's going to be changed. I was about to run around the house just going plumb crazy. We know in 2 Peter 3 that the heaven and earth which is now is reserved to be burned. Right? We know it's reserved in 2 Peter chapter 3. The heaven and earth which are now are reserved and they're going to burn. They melt away with a fervent heat. He's going to take that, his garments off. He's going to fold them up. And he's going to burn them. This is what he's going to burn. You say, preach, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, it gets good. Turn to Levit Leviticus 13. Of all places. Lord, give me this today. I've been studying this subject for 20 years. Didn't see this till today. Was chasing something else and it jumped out at me and I about ran over the dogs trying to run around the house. I was having me a time. It's good. Wait till you get a hold of this. I've told you before, God's not going to do anything that He hadn't already showed us. Do you know what's going on in Leviticus 13? Leviticus 13 is about leprosy. Sin. Rebellion. It's a picture of it's a picture of that. Look at verse 51. In verse 51. And he shall look... Now, wait a minute. Let's go to 50. And the priest shall look upon the plague, that's the leprosy, and shut it up. Now watch. And shut up it that hath the plague. How long? He's going to shut it up that has the plague. How long? Seven days. A day with the Lord's is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. 
7,000 years into man's history, he's going to inspect the garment. Our high priest is going to inspect the garment. He's looking for leprosy, sin, right? Now watch this. Where, where did I say? 50, 50, yeah. And the priest shall look upon the plague and shut up it that hath the plague seven days. And he shall look on the plague on the seventh day. And if the plague be spread in the garment, either in the wrap or in the wool or in the skin or in any work that is made of the skin, the plague is a fretting leprosy. It is unclean. He shall therefore burn that garment. Woo! Y'all ain't excited. Y'all didn't see it. Y'all didn't see it. He's going to inspect that garment after seven days. 7,000 years into human history. He's going to take off his robe. Atheist saying, where is God? I don't see him. You're going to see him. He's going to be the great streaker. He's going to take his clothes off and he's going to snap it. And I'm telling you, we're flying out of here like we don't understand. We're going to stand before him with nothing to stand on while the heavens and the earth are melting away with a fervent heat. He's going to burn this garment. Now, give you another picture of it. Another picture of it. In John 19, you don't have to go there, but John 19, 23 and 24, you'll find that they parted Jesus' garments. And he had a vesture that it made, the Bible made a big deal out of it actually, and said that it was woven. It was like this. It was woven around and it had a hole in the top. And what he did is, it was like a, a, a Mexican's wire. I don't even know what you call it. Like a Mexican's wire, they just put it over their head. Like a poncho, I guess you'd say. There's a, or there, they just put it over their heads and it just hangs down. Does anybody in here have a blanket? Is there a blanket in here anywhere? Is it a pretty big square? It ain't big enough? That ain't quite big enough. It needs to be a blanket. A blanket? Yeah, let me have it a second. I'll show you what I'm talking about. She's going to freeze now, ain't she? Oh, that's warm. All right, here, here's, a, here, here's a blanket. Now, picture it with a hole in the top, and what I did is I just threw it up over my head. All right? My head would go through the hole, and with my arms by the side, what shape is that in? Now, just wait. I'll show it to you. It's a pyramid. See, once it goes over your head, it hangs down like a curtain, and it's in the shape of a pyramid. That's how you get the sides of the north. This is Mount Zion. This is the top of Mount Zion. Right. Amen. Yeah. Where his throne is. So when we're singing about Zion's hill, that's what we're singing about. We're not singing about a place over there in the Middle East. Amen. Right. Thank you. Did that make sense? I hope it did. Amen. But anyway, uh, they, they, the Bible made a big deal there in John 9 that they didn't read it and it said that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. Why did it say that about his garment? There was a prophecy concerning his garment? Yeah. The Bible's about his garment. Yeah, right. Amen. And man's not going to rent it. So much for your global warming. There goes Al Gore. <laughs> Amen. So much for your global warming. Man's not going to be the one to destroy this. He's going to take it out. He's going to destroy it. Now watch. When he put it on, guess what? Christ Is the head. He's the head and we're the body. That's interesting, man. Oh, that's good. That's good. Let me get to looking at it. Let me give you some uh, verses here. Let me think. Let's just go ahead and give you the leaving. I'll have to skip some of this. How many have got a dollar bill? I you, sir. All right. You got a dollar bill. Everybody take out a dollar bill if you got a dollar bill and look at the back of the dollar bill. Here is a notice, notice when Christ wore it, his shoulders would have been the flat spot, and then his arms hanging down would have made up the triangle where, where everything was, like the universe is he's wearing it. What's missing 
on the back of that dollar bill. The top's missing, ain't it? That's right. Notice that triangle? They separate that. It's sitting over it. And then they put this in it, I think. I don't know if you can see it or not, but they got an eye in it, don't they? Oh, my. On the other side, you got an uh, eagle with 13 arrows in one hand, 13, 13 leaves in the other hand. He's got 13 tail feathers, 13 all over that dollar bill. Rebellion. When, all right, now, Christ, according to uh, uh, the Scriptures, He is the cornerstone that they rejected. That's right. And He's become the head. Christ is the head. Amen? Right. He's the head. You're starting to see it now. I'm just going to draw it green this time. This is Him. He's the head. They rejected Him. And according to uh, uh, the Bible, if we'll fall on this stone... He'll forgive us. Amen. That's His first coming. The stone was rejected. The cornerstone, the cornerstone become the headstone. That can't happen anywhere else. You know what the cornerstone is? That's where you start. When you start building something, you start with the cornerstone. You get your cornerstone set and then you draw your line off of it. You start with, the, after the foundation is done, you set the cornerstone, draw the line off of it. They rejected the cornerstone. They didn't want to follow Jesus. He's become the head. And now, this stone cut without hands, according to Daniel, when it comes back the next time, the second advent, that's what them supposed to be at falling. I'm a terrible artist. The second advent, when it comes back the next time, if that stone falls on you, it grinds you to powder. Right. Because he's coming back as king of kings. First time he come back as a lamb, humble and sweet, and shows us all this stuff. We can see it in what he wore. Ain't that book amazing? How even the clothing, made, the Bible made a big deal out of his clothing that they, those wrong, a man's being tortured, a man's being crucified, and the Bible takes time to tell you what kind of coat he has. I did notice this as well. It makes five references, the four gospels, mentions what he wore five times and all five times is coat, garment, vesture. Never once is it called a robe. Never once. That wasn't what he wore. The Roman soldiers put a robe on him to mock him right. and to laugh at him. So you know what they do today in Roman churches? They wear robes. They mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. You think you're a king? You think you're a royalty? You think you deserve worship? Put that purple on him and that robe on him and, and, and worshiped him, bowed him down and mocked him. So what are they doing today? These Roman Catholics and these dumb Protestants wearing these robes thinking they're royalty and deserve worship? Is that what it is? Uh, they mocked him when they put him in that. Then they took it back off. He hung naked and they laughed at him. When he takes his clothes off the next time, they're not going to laugh at him. Proverbs chapter 1, he's going to laugh when their calamity cometh. That's right. Amen. Amen. The best thing you can do now is accept the Lord Jesus Christ because when he decides to, wipe this, to wind this thing up, when he's done and he takes off that garment and he folds it up and throws it down to burn, because it's full of sin. Every dispensation ends in apostasy. It's full of leprosy, which yeah. is a picture of sin. Oh, this is good stuff. I'm teaching better than you're shouting for sure. <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm out of time. I wish I could. Uh, I wish I could give you more. Uh, here's some things that's interesting. Water. Water is restless. Water is restless. If you ever go to the ocean, don't it relax you, though? You can get out there and just listen to that water, and it just relaxes you. Feel the breeze coming off that water and listen to the waves. Uh, if you go get your hotel room close enough to, or, or stay in a cabin close enough to where you can just raise the windows and hear the waves coming in, restless, never ending, constantly moving. But man, don't it just relax you. Just lay there and listen to them waves coming in. Relax you. 
Now, if you've been raised on the water, you'll find yourself drawn to the water. If you was raised up around a lake or a big body of water, you always try to get back to it. You're just drawn to it. It's just, you don't know why. It's just drawn to it. But if you're raised in the mountains, Mount Zion, if you're raised in the mountains, they say the mountains call me. Amen. The, the mountain is stationary. It don't move. You get up and you look outside, it's the same ridge you've been looking at for the last 50 years. Same ridge. But they just call you. It's stationary, but it makes you restless. Wonder what's on the other side of the ridge. You go up there and you gotta look and see what you can see from this ridge, and then you see another, you see another ridge. I wonder what's over that ridge. It makes you restless. That book's amazing. Amen. That book's amazing. All right. Any questions or comments? Uh, I talked about us passing through. Uh, We'll be leaving here. Jesus made several trips through it. When He came down, when He went back up, He's coming back for us. And we're going through it one of these days. We're going to be behind Him. Amen. The rapture of the church. And I showed you that in Isaiah 51. I think it's down there about verse 11 where we're going to be going up through with Him. Amen. That's a spiritual application. And if you'll notice, the dragon's in the context again. Oh, that's good stuff. It's deep, I know. It's a lot. I had to go fast. I should have took three weeks to have covered that stuff. All right. Any questions? Water from the north. Water from the south, too. If you look at the millennium, there'll be water coming from the temple where he would be raining. And there would be medical water. Water to clean up the pollution the government has really committed He's going to clean it up. And here you talk about the dollar bill, and I thought about the teaching of the Masonic Order that teaches that the reason why the cap is off at the top is because the New World Order has not been completed yet. They're working on it. So that when that cap comes down and the pyramid is completed, finally, the New World Order will be established and that order would overthrow God, there would be gods here on this earth. That's the teaching of the Masonic Order. That's why you got to be careful with the monetary system in America, that you don't worship that thing. got to be careful. What I was wanting to point out is how the head was separated from it. And right now the head's not, not in the right control yet. Right now, the God of this world's got control. But one of these days, the head's coming back and he's going to set up control. And guess what? This is interesting. It's, if you go Genesis and you get to looking at the Garden of Eden, if you can get a map out and you run it from river to river and you look, you know what, what shape you're going to find the Garden of Eden in? You look at the millennial reign when it talks about how he's going to give them land. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find the ones that get land. They get, it, it goes a long way like it's right here. You're going to find 12 layers. Pyramid is one of the strongest things you can build. That is amazing. Yes, sir. The pyramid itself the, is what the Garden of Eden was like. There's three scriptures that tell you the three signs of it. Yep. Yeah, so if you think that they have all the land that they have now, wait until the millennium to see how much land they're going to have. I may do a study one day. Brian Donovan, Brian Donovan out of Pensacola Bible Institute has the greatest work on the pyramid. But the pyramid... Uh, is a perfect picture of God's universe. And I'm talking about the pyramids in Egypt. He did a study on the pyramids that I mean it shoots to the constellations. There's mathematical formulas that they that just blows scientists' mind. They cut those blocks I forget how many tons they were, I'd have to do the study again. But huge blocks to a degree so perfect that we today with modern technology and equipment, hydraulics, power, electricity, we still can't cut the stones as square as they did. Those poor stupid Egyptian slaves. <laughs> they had a knowledge we didn't. They had a knowledge of the heavenlies. That's right. It was just, it's just mind-blowing. May do a study on that one day, but the pyramid is an interesting study. Clarence Larkin, 1901, 
19, early 1900s, like 1901, 1911, somewhere in there, he, he did a study on the pyramids too. This is nothing new. Don't think that you're coming in here and your preacher's giving you something new. Now, if it's new, it probably ain't true. 